Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Welcome to another episode on Living on the Edge of Chaos podcast. I am really excited for this conversation. I will say up front, we had a really incredible conversation before we recorded, geez, about a week ago, where I got to learn a lot more about this guest and his philosophy and mindset in terms of thinking about not just AI, which is going to be the topic of conversation here, but I think just learning and thinking and behavior and all so many other offshoots that uh, it was a really incredible conversation for me up front. I think it's going to be just as valuable for you listening today um, because it spun me down a bunch of rabbit holes and some new things to learn about and think about. Uh, and this is what I'm really excited to hear with our with our guest today as we explore AI, but really so much more than that and and not maybe a a typical AI podcast that I think maybe so much of us have heard about where we're not going to break down an acronym of a prompt uh, engineering technique and those types of things, but really thinking about it in a, a, a much different, broader lens, which I think is going to hopefully leave all listeners with more questions than answers, which is always, I think, one of the the joys to bringing on um, guests like Justin here for, for the podcast. So Justin, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and then also how to properly pronounce your last name. So I don't goof that up as we were talking a little bit before we hit record. So Justin, welcome to the show. Who are you? What do you do? What in the world do you got going on, man? Thanks, Aaron. Uh, glad to be here. And just want to reflect back what you said. Great conversation last week. My surname is Khadamase, so it's Justin Khadamase. So I'm from South Africa. So that's a good Afrikaans surname. I grew up English. My Afrikaans isn't that great. So I tell a lot of people that I couldn't pronounce my own last name until I was 13. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't hold it against anybody. Um, but yes, so regarding who I am, my background, I think I will start in the present and then work work my way backwards. Yeah. So for the last couple of months, I've been trying to get a consultancy off the ground called German Ocean. And the niche that I've been focusing on is the intersection between learning design, behavioral design, and AI reasoning support. So how I got into this is the backstory. So skipping back to the to, to my education, I studied psychology and philosophy back in the day, more years ago than I can count. And I did that for a while, started doing a, a master's degree in cognitive psych. And along that road, I got really, really interested in this philosopher named Andy Clark and David, well, and his partner as well at the time, uh, David Chalmers, and they put this idea of the extended mind hypothesis forward. And that just captured my imagination. It just gave me so many ideas. So while I was doing that, I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if <laughs> we can somehow augment the way that people think with technology? At the time, having studied the human mind, how people think, how they reason, it occurred to me that all of these great things that we try to help our students cultivate through years of education, they're actually really hard to, to teach directly. And they take many years of dedicated study and practice to acquire things like critical thinking, creativity, metacognitive skills, like reflecting on your own thought processes. All of these things take an enormous amount of time. And I found myself wondering, what would it mean to use technology to help level the playing field, to allow more people to have access to the benefits of those skills without having to spend the years trying to acquire it first? Um, so that was many years ago. I was still very young, very green, trying to start my own business, creating this thing called Bull Tagger back in the day, which is to use what was then natural language processing before all these transformer AI models 
to pick out things like cognitive biases, rhetorical devices, and um, yeah, it and logical fallacies in text, and just highlight that to people. I did that for a while, you know, got my hands dirty with coding. As with many of these things, <laughs> ran out of money, got a proper job, <laughs> and then I started, um, you know. A, a number of year journey in learning experience design and behavioral design. So that's pretty much where I spent most of my my career, my adult career. Um, yeah, did that for a number of years, headed up a learning design um, function in a company that provided learning solutions and behavior, behavior change solutions to organizations all around the world. So I've had lots of opportunities to work with big consultancies and Fortune 500 companies. Uh, during that experience, I'd kind of parked this idea of, um, as I call it, metacognitive supplementation and reasoning support and focus very much on that. But as I progressed, I started bringing this stuff more and more into my role. Um, I think towards the end, I started to feel like, you know, when I was doing learning design, behavioral design was missing. When I was doing behavioral design, learning design was missing. And both of these things could have benefited from more technological enhancement. And I think that's pretty much where the world is at the moment. So yeah, that, that brings me to today and why I'm, I'm forging this part. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. There, and there's, it's, it, it's such a, you have such a unique background as you're working through AI and and trying to merge these different types of designs and philosophies and things of this nature. You just come at it from a very unique approach that is not typical for um, a lot of people trying to process this, which is why I've I've found your work so fascinating and so excited for this conversation. You know, and so maybe a a, a starting point to kind of maybe kickstart more into to some of this because as you're talking, these might be some some new ideas and concepts that maybe we've heard about, maybe we haven't even heard about them at all. Um, you know, but if we start with you were talking about some of that research there with with, with Andy Clark and the extended mind um kind of mm -hmm. philosophy i know we were talking about that can can we or maybe i'll have not we you'll do it better than i will kind of roughly explain what that is and then talk a little bit about how ai fits into that that equation because i know when we were talking in our first conversation that was one of the multiple rabbit trails that I have been diving into. And it's just such a, I think an important way for people to consider thinking about this, mm. this, this disruption of AI. It's here, there's lots of tools, there's lots of all the things, no matter whatever angle of approach we have, but that kind of philosophy or, you know, thinking through that, mm. um, I think is really important to give people pause to kind of think through like, where do I stand? What is my position on this? And maybe it's not so black and white as, ban it, block it, or use it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so I'll start with a, a kind of an overview of the extended mind hypothesis. I think what makes it quite a paradigm shift in, in the way that we think about the mind is traditionally and, and intuitively, we think of the mind as something that is contained within our skulls. And where the extended mind hypothesis switches or reframes that is saying, well, you know, our minds naturally stretch out into the world. Um, we co-opt tools. We use our environment to not only get tasks done, but to extend the way that our brains actually process information. And, you know, it, it seems a, sort of a far out idea until you start to look at some examples. Uh, I think a really great example, there are a couple of really great examples from the book, but I think a good one would be just think about the invention of writing. Before writing was invented and writing as a technology, before we could somehow enshrine our thinking in symbols that persist longer than we do, um, we were very much slaves to forgetting. But once we have that, we can extend memory beyond our brains and share and then also extend our communication with other people. We can share it across space and time. 
not only that, but writing allows for allowed for an entirely new kind of cognitive processes. We could put abstract ideas down in symbolic form and then read them back so that we could put it into the world. The symbol serves as a scaffold so that we can offload some of the cognitive load or some of the load on our working memory. So we can think a whole bunch of other thoughts and then just come back to what we've written and then bring that back into the context. So not only did it expand, extend our memory, but it also enabled us to expand the range of our thinking and the amount we could consider in a, in a thinking session. Uh, another example, I think a more recent one is um, if you think about people who have Alzheimer's, they're living at home, you'll notice that they put post-it notes in various places. And so essentially what they're doing is they're storing knowledge in the world. Mm -hmm. This is good learning design practice even now, like put knowledge in the world That's and right. don't rely too much of it in the head. But what, what is interesting is that a person with Alzheimer's in a space where they have all of these posts set up, they can remain at a high level of functioning and autonomy for a much longer period of time. But once they're taken out of those environments and put into other environments, suddenly that performance or that the functioning drops dramatically. And it's almost as though they've they've received a lobotomy. It's as if you've removed part of their brains. Yeah. Um, and another example, most of these examples are focusing very much on memory, but we we extend our minds in other ways through a paintbrush or a pencil or a pen or a chisel. Uh, a, a really great concept that they've introduced, aside from this idea of extending your mind, is your your brain is naturally designed to, well, not designed, it, it's, it has a natural tendency to uh, adjust itself to incorporate um, tools into its model of the human body. I mean, for most adults who write with a pen, when you write, you're not consciously aware of the pen. You're consciously aware of the point at which that pen interfaces with the world. If you're a master carpenter or a sculptor, your, your mind is focusing on the point of interface. The chisel is just an extension of yourself. Mm. And the great term that they introduced is this idea of transparent equipment. When you reach a certain degree of skill and your brain has, or your, your neurons have adapted, your neural pathways have adapted to incorporate this. It becomes transparent equipment and an extension of yourself. And then what you can achieve with the tool exceeds what you can achieve without it. Typically, human beings without their tools are pretty vulnerable, fragile things. And so that, that has always fascinated me. In sort of a follow-up work from Andy Clark, I think there's a book he, he titled Natural Born Cyborgs, where he makes this case. And so instead of us thinking about cyborgs who have technology or tools bolted onto ourselves and wired directly into our brain, it's a little bit less invasive than that. Our brains just naturally, through the way that we form mental models, concepts of the world, we incorporate tools. And as we use them fluently, they become an extension of our our minds so that that's the basic idea in a nutshell yeah of i course, love that when we, yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. no 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 no, no 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 i was just gonna say because as you as you frame it up that way to me i think it's so powerful because i do think i mean people listening can't see this but like as i have a pen in my hand and i'm i'm making out my to-do list and i'm taking notes or you know whatever it is that i'm working on I don't think we we take it for granted it just because it's it's just becomes intuition. Um, you know, the, I'm thinking about the you know the amount of writing we do in education, whether that's at a university level or K K twelve, as we're trying to get kids to learn how to read and write, and we're using these. Or I think about the the amount of um, research and design going into like even like digital inking. How do we convince the brain that it still feels like it's kind of paper pencil as we move into that? You know, and the psychology to that. Um, and so I, I didn't want to interrupt you because I'm interested where you were going, but 
I think it's really fascinating is we're thinking about, I'm thinking about it from education. And I know you work beyond that and consult with lots of others and you're doing your own work, which is, which is incredible. I'm thinking about like, I feel like we're okay. We accept the extension of the mind through the written language, because that's what we do in school. You know, and as, as we add on this new layer of AI, thinking about that being like that kind of um, extension of the mind or, you know, another um, piece of armor, you were, you, you, I know we shared one of the things that the best visual that really stood out to me thinking about that was uh, your your example of like Iron Man, which, I mean, you can't see it, but on the other, right in front of me, I have a 9,000 piece mural build of Iron Man. So it really spoke <laughs> to me. Um so I might have you kind of explain that a little bit. You know, I'm thinking about, about about learning, like how do we start to think about AI and maybe start to think about some of our behavioral <laughs> mindset shifts as as the educators or the admin or that professor at whatever level um, to weave this into the learning process because AI is everywhere now, whether we like it or not. And it is, I think, going to be, part of that kind of extension, just like the written mm -hmm. language was, um, you know, where, where, where are you at processing that? And I know I'm coming at it from the educational lens, so you can expand beyond that. But I, I know I just threw a bunch of ideas there, but I'm, I'm really fascinated by that because I think th that ex extension mind thing, when I'm thinking about educators, I'm thinking about the stress they're facing as they go back to school and, oh my gosh, they can just write a paper or have it do whatever. And the kids aren't going to learn. Um, Yes, that's a natural fear, but that's not necessarily the the whole picture of it. Um, how do we start to process all that as well? Um, you know, as this becomes a, this this next extension of the mind, so to speak. All right, I think. Let me start with the Iron Man metaphor. <laughs> yeah, and then take it from yeah, there. yeah. I stacked about ten things right in your on your plate there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've got that. I've got them lined up. I'll I'll get to most of those, but. The Iron Man metaphor really works for me because when what it represents is that essentially we need a bit of a paradigm shift in the way that we think about the functional unit of performance. So currently, when we think about what is the unit of performance, we naturally think it's the human being. We're we're teaching the human being, we're training the human being, we're assessing the human being. But when you think about Iron Man, Iron Man is not just the human being. He's not just Tony Stark. If you were to just assess Tony Stark, sure, he would be, what's that line in the movie? The billion playboy, billionaire playboy <laughs> yeah. philanthropist, right? <laughs> um, you know, but he can't fly. He can't uh, withstand a missile strike. You know, he can't fire you know, energy beams from the palm of his hand. So clearly, Tony Stark is not who you evaluate when you're evaluating Iron Man as the the superhero. Right. But you're also, you're also not evaluating the exoskeleton, the armor, because without a pilot, it is essentially just, you know, some lifeless bit of really expensive technology. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, of course, there's the AI support, which is either Jarvis or Friday, which helps Tony Stark, you know, process lots of information, make quicker real-time decisions, all of those sorts of things. But it's not the AI. It's not the exoskeleton. It's not the human being. It's not Tony Stark independently. It's that collective. And that's the functional unit. So in many ways, when we're thinking about you know, the future and the future of work, which is essentially what we're preparing kids for, we need to recognize that that future will largely be populated by cyborgs in the Andy Clark sense of the word. And if we're not providing them with what, what I've started calling cyborg skills, mm. and I'll dive into what I mean by cyborg skills in a moment, but if we're not preparing them to function as cyborgs, and if we insist on simply trying to train them in traditional ways and focusing on the individual capabilities, but not on how to succeed with these technologies, then we're doing them a disservice. So I think that it's not just, 
you know, as human beings, and this is from behavioral science, we have a status quo bias. And it's not just in our desire to for things to remain the same, but also that we tend to imagine the future as being very much like the past or much like the present. And so, so much of the thinking about the future of work and the future of training and the future of assessment is really just a slight extension of the present when what we might see is something completely different. Mm. So I think that all of these things, whether right or wrong, they're just really, really great to enable us to, to, to start imagining and perhaps even designing a future that is desirable. So that, that was my thinking from the, the Iron Man, the, the unit of the functional unit of performance. Um, when I talk about cyborg skills, though, I do actually mean two separate kinds of skills. One is what are the skills that the human being has to develop so that they can extend themselves with technology? So what are those skills? Um, and the other part is, well, what are the skills? Or what are the, the kinds of cognitive processes that become possible when we see, when we're thinking about the cyborg? Are there completely new kinds of cognitive processes that are possible that we haven't even begun to imagine yet? So that for me is very, very exciting. And the pace at which this technology is going, you know, I feel like we, we have to invest more time in thinking about it. Right now, I think it's in many regards less a matter of science and more a matter of science fiction. We actually need more science fiction authors <laughs> to imagine the future that scientists need True. to work towards or, or imagine. So um, certainly I think that there might be a role for science fiction writers <laughs> if there are any aspiring um, you know, writers in the audience. Yeah, there you go. You know, so something that we we haven't talked about, but as you're as you're explaining this, uh, and I'm thinking about just a few days ago, we ran a workshop talking about artificial intelligence for school administrators with the idea of just trying to think about what's the position, what are some things you need to learn and go back and review and research before you jump into creating policy. And we walked out with way more questions than answers and really for them to realize they have some learning to do, which to me was one of the biggest aha that didn't really want them walking out and going, boom, we got a policy, but like more like we've got some learning, like what, what does this mean? And I think it hits not just on a, a school side type policy as we think about trying to do what's best for kids, but I think also on a personal level, you know, what's that impact in our day-to-day -day lives. And so Maybe there's not a an answer or a stance, but you know, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again, and I'm thinking about the amount of requests to PD of people wanting us to come in and and help. Can you help us do this, do that, and the other? And you try to help people not be scared or have a, a huge fear about this AI. Um, you know, and so some of the the things that I've been working on, and I don't know if it's the right approach, but is thinking like, what's the biggest bang for the buck for them? individually before they start saying what kids can or can't do. And, you know, and you get into this topic of, of, of productivity. And so when I'm interested in here, thinking about your, what you've just been sharing, and I've been kind of thinking about, how I've been trying to frame up some things like how we be more productive, so to speak. And I'm now I'm thinking maybe that's not the, the right answer. I'm almost, and I'm, maybe it's more of let's not use it to be more productive, but how do we, obtain our results or push the human capabilities faster or expedite that process because we have tools that can can help us. And maybe that's one of the same with productivity, but sometimes I think about productivity, like I've got my to-do list and boom, I got through it real fast versus like, here's some things I want to, I need to figure out and boy, I've been able to push my thinking and come up with ideas that I've never been able to do on my own if I'm just sitting with a cup of coffee. So I'm curious on that. It's not really a, a frame up like a and or, or what side you're on but as you're working through this productivity i know you've got lots of things you're creating i know you've got prompts you've been sharing i know you're working on on plugins you've got a lot of a lot of things going mm -hmm. how do you 
sit on that uh, productivity or, or pushing what the human brain can do or, or, you know, is there maybe not even a stance? I'm just curious as, as we're talking today, where, where you think on that. So certainly uh, productivity is a concept that has been the source of many <laughs> <laughs> debates and, and arguments, particularly in, in previous roles where I've had to lead a team of designers and it's knowledge work. It's not, you know, how many uh, tubes of toothpaste can you fill in an hour? It's, you know, if you're developing learning experiences, ultimately your goal is to make money for the organization right. who's paying you to do it. <laughs> but more importantly, um, the focus is the learner. How do they actually learn something and exhibit the desired behavior? The reason you're teaching somebody something in the first place, presumably, is so that they can do something. I mean, there is knowledge for knowledge's sake, but it doesn't right. pay the balls. Right, right. <laughs> um, and so for me, productivity, when it comes to knowledge work, is very different from the notion of productivity that people tend to have without having reflected on it critically. Mm. And it's very hard to think of productivity in all of its complexity. So people tend to build a straw man of productivity and then they use inadequate proxies like time and speed and units produced. So, you know, <laughs> how many how many learning programs have you built in the month in this month? Right? Um, how productive is that? But the thing is that particularly, and I, this is a term that I think is very important, it's conceptual collaborative knowledge work. Mm -hmm. You're not only are you working with ideas and often on challenges that don't have a clear solution, you're working with a whole bunch of other people and you're busy with um, something intangible. So if your goal is to make something that works as fast as possible, it's really not, do I have a to-do list? Can I get uh, this technology to simply just take over the task? Ultimately, what you're trying to figure out is how do I formulate good ideas that other people understand and will sign off on and will work with me to produce. So it doesn't matter how productive I may very well be as an individual. What matters is how productive the system is. Mm. And you'll start to notice that there's a little bit of an echo here of that different functional unit of performance. Earlier, I spoke about the cyborg. It's not the person. Um, it's the person plus the tools plus the AI collectively, but you can take it one step further. It's the person plus the tools plus the AI in a broader system of work. Mm. And that's where we, we start to enter into a realm where we hit the hit clear cognitive limits that human beings have. Human beings are very struggle to, to imagine complex systems. That's why we, have really <laughs> crazy mathematics to try and describe <laughs> it. We, we cannot imagine it, or we build agent-based models so that we can try to visualize it. And we build models that are simplifications of reality. We do all of this as ways to externally support our limited minds to think about complexity. And so this is one of the things around AI that I've been finding really fascinating is Human beings tend to default to using heuristics when a task is too cognitively demanding. So in other words, our brains are lazy, so we use shortcuts. And those shortcuts, if they're good, they get us to the right answer. But if we're using the wrong shortcuts, they give rise to biases. Mm. The, the host of things that you hear about, confirmation bias, sunk cost effect, you name it, right? right. And then it results in bad decision making. So one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a lot is in situations where there is quite a high stake decision to be made and the situation to be assessed is complex, we can delegate a lot of that reasoning to AI to support us rather than the heuristic. And what does the world look like when more people do that? Mm. You know, imagine, you know, 
CEOs who are 30% less biased in their decision making. <laughs> Um, and so it's really just a matter of like, how do you design a system to allow for this? So coming back to the question of productivity, having had discussions and arguments about productivity, often I've tried to dis describe what productivity looks like in systemic terms. And while I'm describing it, there's nodding and there's understanding. But the moment that conversation ends, there's a reset to a default. Let's use this easier proxy to think about it. And, you know, particularly when you're thinking about productivity in a system, being able to map that out and track possibly a hundred different variables or more so that you can develop the most effective result, whatever your goal is, like productivity is always judged relative to your goal. <laughs> if your goal is to come up with the next one, you know, a billion dollar idea it doesn't matter how much um how many baubles you you create or how fast you create them that's not the point so um yeah that that's kind of the idea behind that i don't know if that made any sense no it did yeah yeah no absolutely you know so uh, even like the to add one more layer to that, what I'm curious is, as you're talking through all this and I've seen your work and I'm thinking about the people that in general that listen to this podcast and they're trying to wrap their head around all these concepts that we're talking about, you know, what is, it probably, I know it will depend somewhat on the task, but what's your process? And so as we talk about, I keep coming back to that, you know, that kind of Iron Man metaphor there, right? So as you're working through your work, whether that's a a problem you've been asked to help solve or you're working through some of your own things for your company, you know, can you kind of talk through what that looks like? I'm thinking about the person that's like, okay, like these ideas are making sense. It's still, I maybe I don't know how to say what that means for me personally. And I know everybody works different, but how do you work through the the human mind, your ideas, you know, not necessarily note taking, but then using AI and and can you are you able to articulate that? And sometimes people just do things and you it just you know, I always say like sometimes the good teachers when I'm when I'm in a classroom, like you are an incredible teacher, and they're like, it's just kind of what I do. Like, you know, you do this really well. And they're like, I don't understand why that's a big deal. It's because it's just so instinctual, it's just natural. And it's like, no, you don't realize like people can't do that, <laughs> you know, like they need help with Absolutely. that. Like, so I'll just, you know, it, it's, uh, well, let me see if I can. <laughs> the, the role of an educator is to make implicit knowledge explicit so that you can share it with somebody else. So let's yeah. see the, I think the easiest way to do this is to just tell a bunch of micro stories and sure. then from that extract, extract some, some principles. So to give you an example, it's easy enough to talk about cyborg skills. And once you've wrapped your head around about around the extended mind hypothesis, for example, it starts to become, at least for many people, I've spoken to an exciting idea. But it's one thing to, to say, yeah, it's a good idea. We should do that. It's quite another thing to actually start coming up with a list of actual skills. <laughs> and part of the challenge isn't, as, as I said earlier, when I was talking about the status quo bias and our tendency to try and imagine the future as being an extension of the present rather than very different, is it's very hard to imagine things that have not existed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, think what you want about Sigmund Freud's notion of the subconscious. It was a massive leap in the concepts available to mankind to describe the mind. You know, to get from in an entire world where that concept didn't exist to one where it does. Now we speak about it as though it exists, as though it's natural. True. It's just part of our ontology. But before that, it wasn't, it wasn't the way that people thought. It wasn't part of their vocabulary. So in thinking about what are the skills of tomorrow without getting stuck in simply extending the skills of today is quite a hard task. So to do this, what I did is I sat down with a um, with inflections model pi, which to, to my mind is one of the best 
examples of AI use as a com conversational companion at the moment. Like Claude and uh, ChatGPT, they're great, but they're focused more on being an assistant than a conversational partner. Pi is on your side. It, um, it's, it gently challenges you. It encourages you. It exhibits no judgment. It's just a nice conversational partner. And at the end of each round of conversation, it just asks you a question. Hmm. And it sucks you into a conversation. And a, it, it's quite a great experience because it doesn't get bored. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> criticize you. Um, it doesn't remind you that, <laughs> you know, you have to pay attention to how, <laughs> what, what other people want to hear and do. And, but in any case, so what I spent a lot of time doing is, and of course it is an AI trained on like all philosophy. <laughs> so it knows exactly what I'm talking about by default. And so I just have a conversation with it for an hour, hour and a half, bouncing ideas back and forth, um, and then sub progressively adding more constraints, saying, okay, now that's cool, but can we invent a new word and imagine a completely new cognitive process? Mm. And doing this back and forth, it starts to resolve my thinking and new ideas start to come up in this, this conversation. When I'm done, I ended up with something like 37,000 words of conversation. Um, this should give you some insight into how obsessive <laughs> I can be. Some. No, I get um, it. I get it. <laughs> but but now nobody wants to read back 37,000 words of conversation. So what, I, what I've done is I just took all of that and put that into Claude because Claude has a large context window. You can really just cut and paste that conversation, stick it in Claude and say, okay, just list out the main topics that we discussed and then summarize what was said about each topic. And there I had in front of me a curated, consolidated, organized view of my own messy mm -hmm. thoughts that were expressed over an hour and a half to two hours. And that reflecting back, of course, the AI added some things in, suggested some metaphors. So there really is kind of a blend of me and the machine in that. Yeah. And yeah, I made more progress in thinking through, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, but I made more progress in that short span of time than I would have made in two or three weeks. I would have gotten tired. I would have put it off for later because there's too much friction. I would have maybe had the conversation, but never gone back to transcribe it. And so a lot of that would have gone nowhere. Mm. And now once I have it, I can have AI do lots of things with it. I can turn it into a course. You know, I can turn it into a blog post. I can um, turn it into a list of action items, whatever I want. And so essentially, in many ways, it aside from just extending my cognitive ability, because now I can condense a lot of thought into a much shorter um, span of time, I can also simplify it, summarize it, and make it more digestible for myself. So that that feedback loop between me, my thoughts, the AI, it gets tighter. Um, and in many ways, I can then do things that a team of four people would have had been required to do in the past. The concept is the adjacent possible, mm. right? And so every time you add one more feature, the possibility space opens up exponentially and in many ways this this is a, a concept used to explain how the process of evolution can produce incredibly complex things but it's also true when you add technology so you develop a camera and then suddenly you have all of these additional things that become possible photography can become a profession you can capture um, moments that would have taken hours to sketch out otherwise. So then you develop a smartphone and suddenly uh, people can search the internet no matter where they are. But that would have been dependent on, say, the internet existing. 
So every time you introduce one new thing, the adjacent possible explodes. So that's the one thing that I find very, very exciting about the introduction of AI. There are all sorts of things that are becoming possible because we have these tools and we haven't yet exhausted that. Mm -hmm. The other concept I wanted to bring up, if it's useful, and this, this comes back to um, this idea of the cyborg rather than the human being versus AI, is a design principle uh, that was introduced by Donald Norman. The, the principle is, a, uh, a, or the concept is that of an affordance. Mm. Um, it, it's a quite a fascinating idea, and it's something that I've, I've tried to bring across a lot in my own design work. I don't know if you're familiar with the the idea at all from design. I'm not. I, I not try to encourage everybody. Else. No, yeah, no. I'm, I was just I was just pulling his name up right now. Yeah. So. so that that's from Donald Norman, and the book is the design of everyday things. I just encourage everybody to read that. If you weren't frustrated by doors before, you'll be frustrated by doors <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but basically, one of the more powerful ideas. And it's it's an idea that is uh, borrowed from ecological psychology. Basically, an affordance is a possibility for behavior that arises when two things that have certain capabilities intersect. So that sounds really complicated, but it really isn't when you you start to think about it. If I have this cup of coffee. I'm going to take a sip of, right? And so this coffee cup has a handle, but this handle is on its own, does nothing. It's just there. But because I have a hand that is a certain size with fingers that can articulate in certain ways, this handle becomes grippable. So this idea of grippability, this is not something that the cup possesses or that I possess, it's something that arises when my hand intersects with a coffee cup. The same with a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. You know, a tennis ball on its own isn't throwable. A tennis ball, when placed in the context of a hand that is a certain size and an arm with joints that can articulate, it can be thrown. Not true for a boulder. So <laughs> a boulder doesn't have <laughs> throwability. But if I were the Incredible Hulk, there would be the affordance of throwability, right? Right. And so what's interesting is, at least when you're designing, you're trying to design environments that allow people to see what new actions are possible. So affordances can be visible or they can be invisible. A good designer makes affordances intuitive. And that's the whole point about the doors that I said earlier. If you've ever gone to a door and try to push it when it needed to be pulled. That is a failure of design, right? Because you should not have to ever guess when it comes to True. doors. And I feel like I do that about yeah. once a day, so yeah. <laughs> um, so why this is, why I raise the, the idea of the adjacent possible and affordances is that if you start to think about cognitive affordances, a brain that can do certain things as it meets AI that can do certain things. At the intersection between those things, new things become possible. So affordance, at least to my thinking, and the adjacent possible are very closely linked concepts, hmm. particularly when you're thinking about how to design solutions for the future. So a lot of the work that I feel and I would like to encourage more people to do is to think about what are those affordances that arise? And some of the things that I've been thinking about are, if you think about something as simple as semantic search, Google search can be a pain in the butt, right? You search and you end up with like 20 sponsored links that you can ignore. <laughs> That's right. you, you have like 15 others that come up on top of the, the list because of SEO, and only like on page four, you maybe find the article, but by this time you've already wasted five hours yep. trying to find what you're, 
more often than not, you just give up and you just like accept you'll never know. <laughs> um, but with improved semantic search using AI, I can ask a question in natural language. It will pull the top 50 most relevant things, summarize them all, and then dynamically pull out the information and weave it together to give me my answer. That's like that's instantaneous. So if you think about that as a supplement for one's memory, it it it's incredibly powerful. Um, you know, there are things that I read in a book 10 years ago, and I remember two words incorrectly <laughs> from the book, <laughs> and I have no idea. And when you're writing anything for academic, if you're writing an academic paper and you want to bring in this idea and you want to cite it, but you can't find <laughs> the right book, you, you can't use it. Right. And so just in terms of being able to traverse available knowledge, it's become insane. So now we have a human being who can formulate an intention, who has a vague memory, meeting AI that can search 100 million <laughs> words of text in mo moments. What becomes possible? You know, not only that, but, you know, how many times, I don't know if, if this is just me, but throughout my life, I will come up with a, a random idea and I would have absolutely none of the skills required <laughs> to yeah. do this thing, right? Um, and, you know, starting my own business, one of those things as well, you have to deal with contracts, you have to deal with tax, you have to deal with incorporation, you have to deal with like global money transfers, you, you have to deal with lots of different things that if you've never done it before, it can be quite daunting. Yes. And if you're starting out, you don't have the money to spare to, to hire a bunch of professionals. And one thing that I found incredibly handy is being able to go to AI and say, look, give me five steps to follow and explain it like I know nothing. Explain it like I'm five. Or, you know, I need to build this little bit of code to automate this task. I don't know how to do it. And there's the code right there. And all that I need to do in that interaction is just formulate a clear intention. Right. Um, so I think the question really is like, once we start to imagine what is possible and, and just for research, a lot of what makes human beings creative is our ability to transport concepts from one domain into another. Exaptation, I think, is the, the term where you know, something in an unrelated field is transported into this field and it opens up new possibilities. You can just have AI sort of automatically go and fetch information, do comparisons, and then occasionally feed you with hypotheses in a form that you can understand, even if you can't do that yourself. I get a little bit carried away. There are all sorts of very interesting things. And the sci-fi nerd <laughs> inside of me. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you, you hit on some key things and I think, you know, I want to make sure I stay re respectful of your time here too, because I could just talk and listen to you all day long. And I know you've got, you've got things to do, but you know, as, as we start to bring this to a close, I, you hit on so many important ideas, but you know, I throw my, my education hat back on. I think that, that kind of optimistic view of the possibilities of what can happen when we help not just students but ourselves or just anybody really I think knowing what you want that like you said that clear intention I think that's half the battle do we even know what it is that we're after or trying to obtain I think sometimes we 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 don't know that we don't stake that first and then we wonder why things go goofy and awry and I think that that key thing there is what can we achieve? And I'm looking at in the education space with the possibility of these tools to do the things that we've been working on for so long that sometimes feels like the, the system has been stagnant, not mm -hmm. necessarily from a lack of effort uh, because people pour their heart and soul and whole lives into these, you know, in, into learning and teaching and trying to figure out what's, what's best for kids and for schools and communities. But now we've got this opportunity where there's that, 
short-term fear of cheating or that, you know, and maybe there's a bigger question of instructional practice and, and learning. I think even listening to you, I'm just thinking back about learning and behavioral design. Do we need to go back, kind of refresh some of our own knowledge of what we even know about that to even think about then how do we bridge what we currently do with these tools of AI where it's not, you know, here's school and then here's AI and what do we do? But it's just part of this, like you said, that systems, that ecosystem, which is which is hard to navigate when there's so many other things. So I think you've brought so many great things to light um, for people to think about, but in a optimistic way, but also not like, oh, technology is the greatest thing ever, which sometimes if you go on onto the internet, you know, you, you've got that as well. And mm. it's it's I think it's more just reframing our mindset, our philosophy, and, and and trying to think about, you know, what is possible. And to me, that's the exciting new avenue for people to explore, you know, and there's not, there's not an answer. We, we don't know yet, but not to shut, shut that, that roadway down either. I think coming back to the point, I think what isn't, what's secondary is the technology. I think what is primary is that the future hasn't happened yet. And we can we can design that future, and I think it does serve designers to be pessimistic about okay. the future, right. yeah, and then hope for the best. Um, as as contradictory as that sounds, right? So it's it's useful to think about the possibilities, but also to try and imagine all the things that can go wrong with it. I think we totally missed that when it came to social media mm. and all of the societal harms it's introduced. Um, we're still trying to unpack that and will be for right. many years to come. Yes, we will. <laughs> and and so a failure to anticipate how these things can go wrong can be really, really bad. Um, but at the same time, you're also trying to foster the ways in which the world could be better. You know, another thing that's quite possible, I mentioned earlier, just going back to the idea I had many years ago, if you put an article into GPT-4 now and you say, identify all the possible instances of bias or um, sexism or um, poor argumentation, it can lift all of those out. So it is as much as it can contribute in harmful ways with deep fakes and misinformation, it can also help support mm -hmm. criticality of skepticism and i think that it's it's not the tool that we should be afraid of but the applications and th this may be an unpopular point to make here but uh and i know that we're, we're hitting time now but cheating is a relative concept you know there is a world in which you're saying cheating is just simply attempting to achieve a desirable result using unorthodox means. <laughs> <laughs> and so isn't that what we want in pulling away any kind of like moral connotation? Right. Isn't that what we want for, for our kids or for ourselves? Don't we want to be able to achieve certain outcomes? Um, and not be too strict about, provided you're not breaking the rules and you're not harming anybody, the rules have to change, obviously. I mean, breaking the law and laws mm -hmm. also probably have to change. Right. But the, the point is that what if instead of trying to protect the status quo, because that has also been the point, we create conditions where we expect children to cheat. It would be so much more fun. We just make it incredibly hard so that they have to innovate they have to be ingenious in the way yeah. that they do it um you know like i remember growing up the word hack always seemed hacking seemed like this illegal thing to do but now you have life hacks and you have productivity hacks yeah right yeah, <laughs> yeah it has, it's, it's completely changed yeah i mean it's, it's it, that's that's so true and it you know it reminds me a lot too of that idea of of, of cheating like what like do we have a clear definition of what we mean by that? Like, like, but at the same time we have some of that, but then we are trying to figure out 
how to teach kids to be critical thinkers and how to be creative and how to do things differently and think outside the box, you know, and insert your, you know, whatever your, your, your acronym or famous line is. And then we go into the classroom and not every case I'm generalizing majorly here. And then we say we want that, but only if it's in this very limited confine that fits this one method of, of, of outcome. And then we complain that kids can't think on their own. So there's like, I always find it a little bit, um, fascinating of, of what we say we want and then how we operate. And obviously you got to have some parameter. I'm not saying it has to be the wild, wild west, but I think we we're, we're hitting on, you know, I, I was just reading an article recently about how AI is um, outperforming humans in, um, in, in studying x-rays to detect mm. cancer. Yeah. And um, one of the issues is that the, the technicians or the people that are in those jobs are like arguing it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of ego there, like probably a fear of, of yeah. losing the job. And it's and they're actually saying, no, this is I've been doing this for years. And actually, this is what mm -hmm. I think. And it's not as accurate as a machine. And, you know, there's a whole thing there. But I think there's this also this friction, too, um, mm -hmm. that comes to it when we throw in our ego at this thing. Again, not that yeah. it, like the AI is, is is better than me. But now how do I use these tools to aid to do the best for humanity? I'm not in that job, so I can't speak to it because I'm sure there's probably lots of thoughts that come with it. But it's a fascinating, I find that that mindset piece when it I was is. reading the article so, so interesting. And they dismiss the results from the AI when, it, yeah. even when it's correct. Right. And right. so I think they're just sticking with the theme. There's this idea that AI is over there and I'm over here when actually it's a collaboration and perhaps it's useful to think of yourself as a functional whole. You know, and one of the cyborg skills, the human cyborg skills that we need to develop is the capacity to judge when to trust AI and when not to trust it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's something we do need to focus on, or otherwise we have this incredible tool that can save lives, <laughs> potentially, but then we ignore it when when it comes down to it. But one last thing I wanted to say about the cheating um, and how it can be a feature and not a bug. <laughs> so uh, there's been a lot of many pixels sacrificed on the topic of <laughs> preventing students from using AI to write, yes. um, write essays. And so they invited students to write essays by hand. But then one ingenious kid, I think, used a 3D printer <laughs> and then had it uh, basically had it attached a pen to it and had it write out <laughs> what was AI generated. On a piece That's of paper. awesome. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, if I had a tech company, I'd be like, give this kid a job. Yes, yes, hire him now. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I don't. I won't ask him to write an essay. <laughs> But I mean that. Um, but those are that's the, yeah the exact skills of what we're hoping for. Here are these constraints, um, and and how do we stay intuitive with with what we've got? And in this case, he found a way. He's he still found a way, and uh, <laughs> that is and those but those but that's the skills and mindsets that we're going to need, you know, as we try to imagine the future, or even now, um, or, are those people that can look at a a challenge, a task, a problem you know, and, and sit there and, and, and think of new possibilities. Uh, I mean, that is, you know, how we stay viable, I think, in, in whatever the next workforce kind of looks like, uh, where, you know, how do we tap into the beauty of the brain, you know, and then merging that with some, some AI to, to, to push those to, to new levels of thinking. I think that's, you know, what we got to start thinking about, um, you know, and we've yeah. been trying to think about that, but, there, we, you know, we talk about future ready and getting kids gets ready for the job and the workforce we've been saying this stuff for a long time but now i think ai has really kind of ripped off the band-aid and said okay we can talk about it are we doing it and i think there's this inflection point of okay it's it's time for us to actually start doing it. yeah there is so much to to think about and i, I look forward to seeing what people come up with yeah uh, but on a, on, a, on a final note the thing i want to just say is that instead of looking for hope in our human capacity for critical thinking and creativity. I think a lot of our value in our partnership with technology is the fact that we're messy. 
that we're human beings, we have insatiable like wants and desires. And each of us has unique, unique experiences that happen by accident that produces a unique imagination. Mm. It's, it's that sort of random mutation that allows for progress. But in any case, <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. You know, so Justin, I would definitely want to be respectful of your time. And I, mm. I, I know that people are going to want to learn more about you after this conversation, because if they're like me, their brains just ignite on all levels, you know, with, with, with lots of new things to think about. And I really appreciate your perspective and the work that you do and the fact that you share your work and things like that. People want to know more about you, follow your work. By now, people know, but if this is the first time listening to the podcast, everything will be in the show notes for people to check out all the books that you've referenced and authors. We'll get all all the resources linked in for you to go dive and explore in case you're like, I haven't heard of that. And I'm sure my Amazon cart will get quite full here uh, with, with some more some more books here. Um, but where are the best places for, for people to find you, reach out and uh, learn, continue to learn from you? LinkedIn is probably the best place right now. Um, there's my website, germanocean.com. Uh, but I have some other projects in the works, uh, definitely looking to build out some resources on cyborg skills. Um, and I'll, I'll share that, but yeah, best place to, to find me is on LinkedIn. Yes. And I, uh, give a, a plus one to that. I always look forward to seeing whatever your post or comment is, depending on what's happening in the LinkedIn AI space, which is where I'm doing most of my learning as well. So I appreciate all that you've got going on. And, and more importantly, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time for this conversation. It's just awesome. And it gives me uh, time of this record heading into the weekend. I'm going to be uh, reading uh, the design of, of, of everyday objects here by uh, Don Norman and uh, pushing my own, own learning. So I appreciate you uh, inspiring me to keep my learning going. So uh, I'm glad our paths have crossed and I greatly appreciate the conversation. Likewise, thanks for inviting me. Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos.